This is my second time, but somehow I thought it's a 30 minutes uh, lecture. So I didn't prepare too many slides, uh, but let's see how that goes. It's supposedly one hour. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, we can discuss a lot. You can ask me questions in the middle of my talk. I, I think that's uh, going to slow me down. So Paul discussed uh, wonderfully about how to discover uh, new materials. <coughs> a little bit on flux growth. So flux growth is very much important to extremely powerful, uh, especially to discover new materials, peritactic compounds, for example, incongruent uh, compounds. Now, a uh, small problem with this uh, flux growth is uh, you have to use a crucible. This mat has to be contained by something. And Paul mentioned about this uh, tantalum crucibles. So choosing the right kind of crucible for flux growth is uh, uh, one of the most critical things. And again, uh, 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 Paul discussed about tantalum crucibles. Uh, but often, uh, things like uh, platinum crucible or iridium crucibles are used. But still, uh, the, uh, there can be contamination from crucible to the crystal. This mat can attack the crucible, and then uh, there can be uh, contamination from crucible to the grown <laughs> crystals. So that's why this technique is developed, uh, something called floating zone growth. How can I repeat this? Uh, I just go here. Like this. OK, good. So uh, floating zone growth. The idea is simple. So you, you, you melt this part. The molten zone is floating. That's why it's called the floating zone growth. So this part, we usually call seed. The top part is feed rod. In the beginning, for the seed, we use polycrystal. Feed rod is definitely uh, also uh, polycrystal. And uh, so for this melting, we, we have to heat up this some way. Uh, uh, these days, uh, uh, usually uh, people use uh, uh, infrared light focus here, and then heat up this region so this becomes more to zone. And then uh, one rotates the seed in one direction and feed rod in the opposite direction. And usually this uh, rotation speed is uh, faster uh, compared with the feed rod uh, rotation. And, uh, so, and then the entire thing is uh, slowly uh, uh, pushed down uh, so that uh, crystal uh, grows from here, because crystal uh, keep going up like this. So this is something called uh, floating uh, zone growth. So that's something I'm going to discuss. So before discussing this uh, uh, floating zone growth, uh, Paul mentioned about this uh, Moore Foundation uh, giving us money uh, to do <coughs> quantum materials research. Uh, uh, very recently, uh, uh, they uh, uh, gave uh, uh, a big support to establish a new center, something we call Center for Quantum Materials Synthesis. So I want to ad advertise this a little bit. Uh, <coughs> Jack Shakalian, who's going to uh, uh, give a lecture sometime later uh, in this morning, uh, he does uh, so-called PLD, Pulsed Laser Deposition Film Growth. That's uh, Jack Shakalian. And Sean O, oh, uh, he's going to give a lecture, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, what he does is uh, uh, so-called uh, MBE, uh, Molecular Beam Epitaxy. Uh, film growth, that's what he does. And what I do is uh, uh, this uh, bulk single crystal growth, flux growth, as well as uh, uh, this floating zone growth. And we're also trying to uh, uh, set up this uh, Sokrasky uh, furnace uh, at this uh, uh, center. So here the whole idea is uh, uh, the CQMS, uh, we want to have a synergy between bulk single crystal growth and film fabrication. That's the idea. And uh, uh, also, one of the things we do, uh, uh, CQMS, is uh, organizing this uh, symposium. We call this a symposium on QMS, quantum materials synthesis. So this school is 
mostly about quantum materials uh, synthesis or growth. It's a school. Our symposium is very much complementary. This is uh, focusing more about uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, up-to-date uh, kind of research on quantum materials uh, uh, synthesis. Uh, we do also uh, some characterization, but mostly about synthesis. Very first meeting was uh, uh, two years ago, 16. It was in World Trade Center. Right? That was uh, very successful. And this fellow, uh, uh, Shuji Nakamura, uh, who discovered uh, uh, blue LED uh, lighting, he gave a uh, 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 keynote speech in this uh, meeting. And that meeting was uh, very successful. And then last year in Berlin, uh, there was a second meeting, uh, October uh, 17. And this year, uh, there will be a meeting in Shanghai, uh, November uh, this year. Uh, you guys may be interested in this. So in CQMS, something relevant to you uh, is, uh, uh, directly relevant to you is uh, we have this visitor program. Uh, you can write a very short proposal. Here again, the, uh, the main idea behind CQMS is uh, synergy between crystal growth and film fabrication. So if you have any idea what can be done in terms of this kind of synergy, then you can write a proposal. And you can visit us, and uh, we can provide uh, <coughs> a flight accommodation, uh, even materials we can provide. And uh, this is a very short proposal. So if anybody interested, you can ask me questions, or we can discuss after this talk. OK, so crystal growth. Crystal growth. So uh, this crystal growth is not something you learn in chemistry class, neither in physics class. But uh, as uh, Paul discussed, uh, crystal growth is very much important for new science as well as uh, new technology. It's clear. So uh, uh, this school uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, probably the best place to learn uh, this uh, uh, crystal growth using various different techniques. It's a floating zone technique and flux growth techniques. And, and uh, especially uh, JP set up this uh, uh, symposium in the very beginning of the year. So uh, studying the whole year just uh, through this uh, school is just absolutely wonderful. Hopefully this continues uh, for a long time. So in terms of uh, enabling uh, crystal growth uh, uh, can enable new technology, probably this is a, 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 a one of the best examples. So transistor. So these three people discovered the transistor, 1947. How that was possible? How they discovered this transistor? There was some theory behind this, but the most critical part is uh, so this fellow, Bill Fan, Bill Fan at Bell Labs, he discovered something called the John refining. John refining. So basically what you do is, uh, you have, if you have a crystal, you melt a small part of the crystal, and then you keep moving this uh, molten John from one side to the other side, then you can purify the sample that way. Some dirt or impurities can move along this uh, uh, molten zone motion uh, so that you can remove this uh, 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 junk to one side of the crystal and you can use this clean part to make this transistor. So that was the most important breakthrough just enabling this uh, transistor discovery. Anybody knows uh, what crystal was used for the first transistor? Not Lauren, but... <coughs> Anybody? Just said, germanium. germanium. Okay, excellent. So yeah, that's right. It was not silicon. It was germanium. The main reason was uh, uh, germanium melting temperature is much lower than silicon melting temperature. Very simple reason. Those days, 40s, 30s, they didn't have enough technique to melt this uh, 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 silicon nicely and uniformly so that uh, they used the germanium. So this germanium uh, was the uh, uh, first transistor. So this zone refining is uh, to again purify uh, a, uh, uh, a crystal, but uh, 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 the, uh, this technique was uh, developed in the early 40s. Uh, 
And then uh, a little bit later, about 10 years later, uh, same place, Bell Labs, uh, this fellow uh, used the same technique uh, and developed this uh, crystal growth technique, something called floating zone growth bonus he invented. So the uh, very original idea uh, uh, system was uh, uh, something like this, using so-called induction <coughs> heating, <coughs> microwave induction heating. Uh, so microwave is uh, uh, focused here, focused here. So this molten zone is like this, and then crystal grows like this. So this uh, something called concentrator looks like this. So microwave uh, um, uh, goes like this and uh, uh, the heating is focused here. So can you go back to the Yes. Can we do that back? Uh, One more? Uh, yeah. Um, four, so four and six, and so there's this incredible necking for yes. the molten zone. That's right. And then the liquid spreads out. Spreads out in the bottom because of is the... the surface tension? Uh, Why is it spread? What's, what's causing it to spread out like yeah, that. Yeah, so it partially because of a surface tension. Yeah. Surface tension kind of spreads like this okay. because of basically plus weight, right? Weight of the liquid kind okay. of pushes down. Uh, but, uh, okay, so this is not something I did, so I don't know the details. Sure, my it's, guess it's, it's is... It's uh, just intriguing. Yeah, my, uh, yeah, my guess yeah. is, uh, so uh, surface tension is... Uh, uh, actually, surface tension is going to reduce this diameter. And the weight is going to spread oh, this. Okay. Weight is going to spread this. But I, I think they adjust the, all the parameters in yeah, such a way that they can grow big crystal. Yeah. In order to grow big crystal, you have to have some kind of spreading like this. Right. So I, I think they adjust the shape of this concentrator and the microwave power, all these things, to get a large enough crystal. And they also, maybe they change the falling rate, top and bottom. Is that can also so have some so influence. Yeah, that can also influence the, the, yeah. Not quite. No, no, well, that's a user. Okay, so that's a good point. So usually, even if you have a same motion speed, so putting this down, both of them, even if they are same speed, this is a polycrystal, this is a single crystal, so they usually this diameter goes down a little bit. You know, something like 10%, 20% going down is very typical. So to me, this looks like kind of same speed, but in general, JP is absolutely right. We can change the speed, this one and that one. We can control this. They can be different speeds. So since you have this, okay. just for the, the audience, so do you know what, what's the state of the art in silicon single crystal growth? What's the largest? I, 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 get, I get back to okay. that question. Yeah, I get back to that question. Okay, okay. good, good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, so that's, uh, uh, okay. So initially this uh, uh, floating zone technique, they used induction furnace. Now, uh, induction one is, is uh, you have to have uh, this uh, huge microwave generator, and uh, uh, that requires a huge electric power, and it's very difficult to control. And uh, it tends to produce microwave noise, so your neighbors don't like it. <laughs> produce all kinds of noise, mechanical and electrical noise. So that uh, this uh, uh, new technique has been developed, uh, optical heating using infrared lamp basically halogen lamp. And especially uh, this uh, uh, optical heating is very uh, useful, very powerful for insulators. Again, Paul discussed about the metallic system. For metallic system, this induction furnace does work well. But insulators, uh, uh, this uh, uh, optical heating is uh, uh, very useful. All days, before this uh, halogen lamp, uh, or uh, thinner lamp, uh, we uh, used to have this uh, very uh, 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 strong uh, lamp that was a carbon arc, carbon arc. Uh, I believe uh, uh, all these uh, London street lamps were all this uh, uh, carbon arc lamp. Not just the street People lamp. People were breathing C60 all the time. C60 all the time. <laughs> breathing C60 all the time. Not just that. When you watch a movie those days, they used movie projector. They used arc, uh, uh, this carbon uh, arc uh, lamp like this. <coughs> carbon arc lamp like this. And uh, uh, so uh, using this uh, uh, carbon uh, arc lamp, for movie projector. So this fellow developed this technique 
using this uh, 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 arc lamp focus and then uh, do this uh, protein growth. So this is one of those uh, uh, very early uh, uh, crystals grown uh, early 60s and late 50s. So the, since it's, uh, it does uh, use uh, uh, this uh, infrared lamp, uh, how you focus these lamps, that's very much important. Also, how many lamps you use. Uh, so uh, various different techniques uh, uh, shown here. Uh, most common one, so very original one, uh, they use just one lamp. You focus like this. Most common one is uh, uh, this one, using either two lamps or, or even two additional ones, so that four lamps. Or it can be like this, uh, uh, two ellipsoids are up and down, and you can uh, focus here. Lamp is sitting there. And there are uh, three main companies in the world producing these optical furnaces, protein uh, furnaces. Two Japanese ones, they produce uh, uh, this kind. <coughs> used to be NEC, now it's under Canon. Uh, that uh, uh, optical protein uh, zone for this does use two lamps. And so there's another Japanese one that's called Crystal Systems. Crystal Systems uh, product, they use four lamps. And then there is a Russian one uh, that's now taken over by uh, 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 Germany, Dresden, uh, some company, and they use uh, this configuration. Nice thing about this configuration is uh, uh, in this uh, uh, azimuthal direction, this is uh, symmetric. It is symmetric. So while it's moving, uh, rotating, temperature is supposedly identical. No variation of temperature. But in this case, if you use two lamps, even four lamps, when you rotate this, temperature goes up and down. Up and down. There is, uh, 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 usually there's uh, this advantage having this temperature fluctuation, but sometimes you can utilize the temperature fluctuation. When you have a molten zone like this, inside of the molten zone, there can be convection. This convection, how to control this convection <coughs> is uh, very much important. So uh, again, this is a seed and there's something we call uh, feed rod. And uh, 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 there can be uh, all different kinds, but this is the most common way. So near the surface, we have one convection, and inside we have another kind of convection, uh, just like this. So the surface convection is usually something to do with uh, this uh, surface tension. So remember, light is focused here, so light absorption is happening mostly near the surface. Same thing here, near this uh, surface. So heating is done here, so density changes and the uh, surface tension changes is different here and there. That induces uh, surface uh, convection. In addition, uh, inside of course there's also some temperature gradient. In addition, you rotate this, <laughs> As I said, this uh, 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 seed we rotate somewhat fast, and the uh, feed rod we rotate in opposite direction, but somewhat slow. If you rotate this very fast, that produces actually centrifugal force. That centrifugal force uh, basically pushes it like this way. That does contribute to this uh, bulk convection. So having two kinds of convection certainly influences uh, uh, what happens in this uh, grown single crystal. So Yes. Naively, knowing nothing about uh, a floating zone, I would have thought B is your ideal. Uh, yeah. Is that correct? Ideal, you ideal, said? Ideal. Uh, in, in the sense that more uh, homogeneous, you mean? More homogeneous. More homogeneous, exactly. yeah, right. You can say so. You can say so, uh, but not, you know, uh, in, in some sense, uh, if you have a uh, one kind of convection and fastest convection will be best in the sense that you can kind of mix them. Okay? Uh, if you have compositional complexity, you can mix them. So it doesn't matter you know, uh, this kind or that kind. What is important is uh, this liquid crystal interface. This, that part doesn't matter. So that you know, this, 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 there's right, not too a, much difference. A is going to give you a radial inhomogeneity. That is correct. Okay, fine. That is correct. But in reality, as I said, since the light is coming from the surface, yeah. usually this is what happens. Yeah, understood. Okay, usually that's what happens. But still, you can control uh, by having a, temperature, a different kind of a light focusing on the surface and also having a different kind of rotation. You 
again, control up to some degree this uh, bulk convection versus uh, surface convection. So you're absolutely right. So if you do have uh, uh, this uh, two kinds of convection, that does influence uh, uh, what happens in the uh, ground crystal. So here shows one example. So this is some hexagonal system, okay, hexagonal system. Uh, while we try to grow hexagonal uh, single crystal, in fact, lutetium, iron, O3 is a hexagonal system. Lutetium, what did they say? Lutetium manganese O3 is a hexagonal system. Lutetium iron O3 is orthrhombic system. Orthrhombic system, okay? But we try to make uh, this kind of mixed uh, 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 crystal. By the way, uh, uh, this uh, floating zone growth, unlike uh, flux growth, flux growth is almost, uh, you change the temperature very, very slowly. And temperature is more or less uniform around your crucible. So it's almost a thermodynamic equilibrium growth. Compared with that, this uh, uh, floating zone growth is uh, extremely brute force growth. Thermodynamically unstable uh, growth is uh, far away from thermo, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, so that after growth, we always do so-called post milling in order to reduce any kind of defects or strains produced during the growth. So uh, this is a kind of typical sequence for post annealing, something like 1,000 degrees C overnight and uh, uh, slow cooling down to room temperature. That's what we usually do. And grown crystal looks like this. So this is a seed. This is a grown crystal, crystal ball. And then this is the original uh, uh, feed rod left over after this growth. It looks like this. Now, because of two kinds of convection I discussed, grown crystal of this. So here, usually what we do is after growth, we cut like this certain part of this uh, crystal ball, either bottom or top. Usually we do actually uh, top, but this particular case we did more or less uh, close to this bottom. So we cut this uh, thin disc shape uh, crystal, and then we polish. And then up, uh, under optical microscope, in fact, this is a polarized optical microscope, uh, the crystal looks like this. So this is a uh, uh, crystal ball surface, near the surface, and then this inside. So definitely they are quite different under a polarized optical microscope. So oh, what happens is uh, this near the surface, we have orthrhombic phase. Orthrhombic phase. Inside is hexagonal. Hexagonal. So we don't know exactly what is happening in terms of composition, but uh, very likely inside here, manganese concentration is somewhat higher, so that it's a hexagonal. And near the surface, or oh, iron concentration is somewhat higher, and then becomes orthrhombic. I see you, you've not done elemental analysis. We have not done uh, uh, elemental analysis. That's kind of guess. But uh, at, at least in terms of structure, this is uh, clearly hexagonal that is uh, orthrhombic. And uh, this uh, difference between uh, inside and bulk uh, near surface is most likely due to two kinds of convection I discussed. Yes? Like there's some kind of conclusions? Oh, this is just crack. That's a broken part. It's a broken part. During the cutting, it just breaks. But there are uh, all this additional structure. So that means this is not <coughs> one absolutely beautiful one crystal. It's not. OK, so, uh, so two structural phases, likely due to a slightly different chemical composition. That's what you saw in the previous slide. And uh, not just that, sometimes uh, the situation can be much worse. Uh, this case uh, uh, is uh, uh, nothing to do with this uh, surface convection versus uh, uh, bulk convection, but this uh, uh, is uh, 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 something to do with uh, precipitation of second phase. Uh, something we call uh, iron langosite. We grew this crystal uh, using this uh, protein joint. And uh, uh, crystal is uh, absolutely beautiful, uh, kind of reddish color uh, crystal. And uh, you see two things. One is, uh, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is a crystal cut, uh, uh, the disc uh, I was talking about. And then uh, polarized up optical microscope looks like this. That cut is, uh, when you have crystal ball like this, we cut that way, 
plate shape. And then again, uh, 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 this uh, polarized optical microscope image here. So growth direction is out of the plane in this case. In that case, growth direction is uh, along this direction. So you see lots of dots here, lots of dots. That's because of uh, second phase uh, precipitation. Not just that, if you uh, look this, this direction, then you see that black dots uh, accumulate a certain uh, uh, way, and there is certain periodicity. Certain periodicity, that periodicity is something we call growth striation. So uh, uh, if I blow up this part, uh, in fact, you look uh, kind of a hexagonal shape uh, uh, the second phase, small crystal embedded in the bulk crystal. Uh, that turns out to be just a simple uh, magnetite. Iron 304, okay? So this a magnetite, tiny crystal, uh, kind of a 10 uh, uh, micron, 20 micron size, small hexagonal shaped crystal uh, precipitates out of this crystal. And those crystals, uh, if I go back here, uh, tends to accumulate, tends to form this uh, striation like this, okay? So this striation, this distance, uh, Okay, so this uh, okay, so this distance is something related with this rotation speed, seat rotation, feedback rotation, as well as the whole growth speed. These three parameters tends to determine this uh, uh, fluctuation of second phase precipitation. What is However, the yes, the typical uh, pulling rate. Polling rate, this particular one I don't remember, but usually it's a few millimeter per hour. Yeah, this particular case I don't, oh, it's here. Okay, so yeah, so a few, four millimeter per hour. Uh, so initially we got some crystal like this, <coughs> and then later on we were able to get crystals having no second phase. This black thing is just cracks in the crystal, okay? Uh, so this is a really uh, a single crystal without having it is a second phase. Even near the surface, uh, it seems uh, it's a single phase. Uh, it is crystal. And we found uh, that uh, uh, by optimizing this uh, growth speed, as well as uh, applying some pressure. So this particular case, uh, we found this is a, a very useful, very important. <clears throat> so for this uh, iron langosite, optimum crystal growth condition is like here. What is important is uh, this feed rod has to be high density, very high density, strong and high density. That's a, uh, very critical, very critical. And it should be very clean in terms of stoichiometry. There should be no second phase. If there is any tiny bit of second phase in the feed rod, then even if you melt this, this uh, second phase uh, may remain in this melt and becomes an equation center for the uh, uh, growth of the second phase in the final crystal, uh, so that not having a second phase in the field rod is, uh, in this particular case, is important. It is important. And this high density, uh, I'll uh, discuss a little bit more later on. So this particular uh, crystal, iron langosite, uh, we found this is a kind of optimum uh, uh, growth speed. And uh, this, in addition, we found that not having the second phase, uh, this high pressure auction is important. A few bar type auction pressure is important, we found. And this uh, is probably, uh, second phase tends to be iron 304. And part of this iron 304 is Fe2 plus. So that's a kind of reduced form. It does not like this uh, auction environment so that you can express this second <coughs> phase by having auction pressure. So this is a kind of a trick you can play. And we found the rotation speed is not so important. And infrared furnace was, uh, this is uh, L means uh, laser. Uh, I, I'm gonna show you some about this. Uh, we found uh, these two different machines did not make too much difference. What's the pulling speed? That's here, four millimeter per hour. Yeah, Oh yeah, the, 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 it does influence the quality of a crystal. Yeah. If it is too fast, you tend to get second phase. If it is too slow, the molten zone becomes unstable. It's very difficult to have a nice crystal. Many cent centimeter size crystal is difficult to grow if you uh, slow down this too much. Uh, basically because if you slow down very much, if you grow very, very slowly, you may feel this kind of gentle growth is gonna have a better crystal. But uh, the problem is uh, it's so brute force growth, right? Room temperature is here and then just about here in like 1500 degrees C. It's extreme temperature gradient 
and extreme heating uh, locally. Uh, because of that, uh, evaporation is a very serious issue, so that if you do very slow growth, evaporation becomes more and more and more issue. Yeah, so there is always a kind of optimum uh, growth speed. Another thing I, uh, I want to emphasize is, uh, uh, again, we are discussing here you know, how, to, how to optimize this growth. The idea is very simple, right? You melt and you just slowly push down and then you grow crystal. But in reality, it's a lot more complicated. And uh, 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 one thing uh, happens often is, uh, uh, so this is Morton John here. This is a feed rod. It's a polycrystal. So the polycrystal never have 100% density. There's always porosity. There are holes here. So Morton John here, porosity, feed rod with porosity, so that this uh, mat can be sucked into this uh, feed rod. And then some cold spot somewhere, it can uh, deposit. It can now grow here. So wing-like feature here can develop. Uh, so uh, we have to avoid this uh, wing development. That's uh, very much important. For that, uh, uh, this is most critical, high density feed rod. <coughs> I believe uh, Jay Chakalian is going to discuss about this uh, 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 PLD growth, pulsed laser deposition uh, uh, growth of films. For that, one of the most practical, uh, 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 important aspect is having good target, high density target. That's very much important. Just like that, in this uh, floating zone growth, having high density uh, feed rod is uh, most uh, important. It, 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 it sounds simple, but in reality, that's the uh, most challenging one. One has to fight with this uh, all the time. So high density, what does that mean? High density, if you don't really spend much time, you prepare poly sample. Polycrystal, the density, compared with the theoretical density, is uh, barely above 50%. Lots of holes in your sample, okay? You spend some time and making you know, more than 80% is already a challenge. If you go something like 95%, it requires a very special something. Uh, people often use even high pressure and things like this, okay? So uh, having this uh, uh, high density uh, feed rod is most critical. And uh, sometimes we cannot really uh, do this. Then what we do is uh, so-called two-step growth. First step, we just grow very fast. So basically, we melt, we prepare just a polycrystal, but high density uh, 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 kind of polycrystal. And then second growth, we do very slowly. But since you melt twice, uh, I mentioned about this evaporation problem, so that uh, this evaporation, you basically you do twice, even though first time it's a very fast <coughs> growth. Uh, because of this uh, uh, doubling this uh, uh, evaporation problem, uh, this uh, sometimes it work, works, but not always. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, kind of a, uh, another uh, very useful uh, technique, uh, uh, but it's very brute force. That is uh, this. You rotate, rotate a feed rod very, very slowly. Okay. Rotate feed rod very, very slowly. So the idea is this. There are either two lamps or four lamps. So that along this azimuthal direction, there is a temperature fluctuation when you rotate this. If you rotate this slower, this fluctuation is more. Up and down is even more. If you do faster, then you equilibrate so the temperature fluctuation is less. So by doing slow rotation of a feed rod, temperature fluctuation is more up and down. So basically what it, what it does is uh, you accumulate and then the temperature going up, you melt this. You accumulate and melt this. By doing this, uh, you limit the growth of this. It does not become too large. That's the idea. Uh, so this seems a very uh, uh, naive idea, but it does work very often. What do you call very slow? Oh, okay. So uh, this is, uh, uh, we, we do something like uh, 10 to 60 rotation per minute. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, uh, usually about uh, almost 10 times uh, slower than that. Uh, five, times, five times slower than that. So slow means like uh, one uh, rotation per minute. That's slow. Okay. Now, another thing is this. Another thing is, uh, so this is uh, gallium iron O3. Gallium iron O3, and this is, uh, in fact, first, it's oxide, obviously, uh, but first, ferri uh, uh, magnetic piezoelectric material. It's a piezoelectric, mm -hmm. where, in fact, it's a polar, uh, not for ferroelectric, but it's a polar 
so that it is uh, piezoelectric and also very magnetic. Uh, it was also discovered by uh, at Bell Labs, and it was uh, done by this fellow called Joe Romica. Romica, some of you guys uh, probably know Romica. So that uh, some people call this uh, Romikite. <laughs> Romikite, okay, Romikite. So uh, we grew crystal of that. Uh, he used the flux growth technique uh, those days, uh, uh, 60s and 70s. And he grew a couple of millimeter size uh, uh, crystals of uh, Remikite. And, uh, but we used this, uh, 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 this floating zone technique and we grew crystal. If you go crystal, uh, as I said, uh, in the very beginning, you don't really have a seed crystal. So we use a polycrystal as a seed and then we grow crystal. That this becomes not really one crystal. It, it's a polycrystal with big grains, and then we cut top part of that and use that as a new seed, and then do second growth. Sometimes the third, fourth growth. We have to keep doing this, you know, eventually to get a uh, uh, single crystal. So very often we get uh, uh, this kind of uh, polycrystal with big grains. These grains are big. You know, to minimize this, uh, 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 this multi-grain growth, well, in order to pick up just one uh, grain, uh, uh, we uh, use this technique called uh, necking. Okay, basically you narrow down by changing the, uh, this uh, pushing speed, uh, growth speed, uh, narrow down, and then tapering growth we do. Uh, so doing that, uh, we uh, can choose more or less a smaller number Hopefully, just one uh, uh, grain, and they grow one uh, crystal. Uh, that's, uh, uh, uh. So this necking is also a uh, very important uh, 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 idea. So uh, this necking, uh, uh, depending on who does this, uh, some students have, have excellent <laughs> skill. <laughs> so the necking can be this extreme. I've never seen you know, this small necking, but it's all well connected. It's not broken part. It's so necking here, so pick up one grain and then nicely grow crystal. Okay, so you, one can do this kind of extreme necking. necking. Uh, it does work. I mentioned about this laser diode heated floating zone uh, uh, technique. This is a relatively uh, uh, new uh, growth system. Yes? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That happens all the time. So uh, uh, it, it happens all the time. Not somebody, you know. It, it happens all the time. And uh, thing is, uh, 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 so uh, floating zone growth. Again, the idea is very simple. You melt it, you just push down, you grow crystal. But in reality, what is most important is uh, stability of molten zone. Stability of a molten zone is most important. Their stability, uh, for example, it is sucked up to the feed rod and then something develops here, then it's not stable. Okay? And also necking, if it's very stable, it's easy to do necking and then kind of grow back to large size. Uh, uh, so stability of a molten zone is very, very important. Okay? That's most critical. And in fact, the one I'm going to discuss here, laser floating zone, the big advantage of this system compared with standard infrared lamp heated protein <coughs> zone is stability of molten zone. It's extremely stable. So uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, laser diode uh, heated uh, protein zone, laser diode. Last uh, about five, five years, semiconducting laser has, the technique has improved just so drastically it's so powerful, it's unbelievable. 10 years ago, we couldn't even possibly imagine to have this kind of power. Uh, you know, this laser pointer, red color. You know how much power this has? Anybody? It's written somewhere here. With my eyes, I cannot read. There is a legal limit. There is a legal limit. Uh, in America, you cannot have a more than two milliwatt laser pointer. Illegal, if you say. So what it means is usually it's uh, about one or less even. Two is a legal limit. Two milliwatt per uh, milliwatt, two milliwatt. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, 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 again, these crystal systems produce this uh, laser diode heated uh, floating zone. They use uh, five uh, uh, laser diode, uh, diode lasers, five of them. Each one is 200 watt, okay? So 200 watt compared with the two milliwatt, 
each one is 200 watt and five of them. So it's a lot of power. Okay, so 200 watt laser is a lot of power. And five of them. So it's a lot of power so that we can go very high temperature. Well, so far, uh, we don't, there is some guarantee period. Uh, Solomon, do you remember? Is it 1,000 hours? There is some guarantee, 1,000 hours is guaranteed, yeah. Uh, right. And uh, so probably what it means is guaranteed, uh, uh, you know, under warranty, so that uh, uh, probably we, we expect, you know, uh, probably much more than 1,000 hours. But, but I mean, that's only yeah. a month. If you use it, if you keep this uh, uh, on all the time, yeah. If, if you keep that on, uh, on all the time, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. But, uh, 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 yeah, right. Uh, right, right, right. Okay, yeah, so, uh, you know, that kind of stability issue, laser stability issue was, a, you know, kind of original uh, <coughs> question. But so far, you know, it, it's working very well. And it's a lot of power so that we can go very high temperature, very high temperature, okay? So, uh, the infrared uh, optical fluorescent zone furnace, uh, the, the best kind of test uh, 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 sample is aluminum oxide because the melting temperature is slightly above 2,000 degrees C and halogen lamp furnace is supposed to go something like 2,100 degrees C. So this is a good test sample. For this laser floating zone, uh, in fact, this hafnium oxide is, uh, turns out to be a good test uh, sample because uh, this, this can go up to something like 2,800 uh, 2, uh, degrees C. Okay, so it's, it's a lot of power. But again, this is a 200 watt, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm uh, working with this company, in fact. Uh, uh, we try to go higher than 3,000 degrees C. And, uh, uh, right, 3,000 degrees C. That's kind of a uh, goal. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, try to have some pressure. So we have this infrared at Rutgers, uh, CQMS. Uh, we have infrared floating zone, uh, regular infrared lamp heated floating zone here. <coughs> right next to that, we have this laser floating zone. And we got this uh, very first one in the US. Uh, this is from Japan, Crystal Systems. So we were able to uh, grow this uh, uh, crystal. So the very first video I showed you is actually hafnium oxide. Uh, so we grow a hafnium oxide crystal I, that I'm going to discuss a little bit later. Uh, but before that, uh, I don't know if, if, if anybody worked on uh, oxide, uh, possibly you heard about this uh, compound. Uh, 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 this fellow discovered uh, uh, kind of a new uh, blue oxide pigment. Absolutely beautiful blue color uh, uh, around this uh, composition. So it's a uh, hexagonal yttrium, indium, O3, and then manganese dot. And all of them are relatively cheap. Yttrium is a rare earth, but yttrium is relatively common, so that it's uh, 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 cheap. And manganese is much cheaper than cobalt. Cobalt blue, I'm sure you heard about this. Cobalt tends to give this blue color, but cobalt is quite expensive. Uh, compared with cobalt, manganese is much cheaper, and indium is also. Uh, uh, okay in terms of price. So he discovered this uh, uh, new uh, uh, pigment, blue pigment, but nobody was able to grow a single crystal of this. It was done about 10 years ago, but nobody was able to grow this single crystal because uh, uh, it's very difficult to melt indium oxide. It has a high melting temperature and also high vapor pressure. But by using this laser fluting zone, we were able to grow crystal like this. So you now you know, crystal ball and necking here, and after growth, we broke this and we polish. Uh, so it's uh, absolutely beautiful crystal like this. Absolutely beautiful blue color, transparent crystal. We grew for the first time by using this uh, laser fluting zone. So it's an extremely powerful technique. So we already discussed about uh, uh, controlling uh, various parameters. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we, we can uh, uh, have a different uh, uh, kind of optical power. It can be infrared the lamp, or it can be laser. And uh, this uh, also focusing is very much important. So this power plus focusing <laughs> determines temperature as well as temperature gradient. This temperature is, of course, important. To, uh, it should be above the melting temperature. However, uh, in reality, delta T is actually the most important parameter. Delta T, temperature gradient, is uh, the most important parameter. As I mentioned, molten zone stability is uh, most <coughs> critical when you grow crystals or necking, anything like this. Uh, 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 for that, having larger temperature gradient, actually you can stabilize this molten zone uh, very easily. Uh, 
so the size and shape of molten joints related uh, very often on uh, this uh, delta T. Rotation speed, seed and feed rod, rotation speed is uh, uh, certainly important. This induces convection, so it, it, it induces uh, uh, sterling. If you have a compositional complexity, if you have a more convection, you tend to mix more, stir more, uh, so that you tend to get more homogeneous uh, 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 mixture. In any case, uh, still, uh, 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 there is a temperature oscillation. Okay? There is temperature oscillation. So again, uh, as a mutual direction, there is a temperature variation because you have a find the number of lasers or infrared lamp you use, two, four, or five. Because of that, temperature goes up and down. Tem always temperature goes up and down. That does influence uh, this uh, solid, uh, 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 the liquid uh, interface. What happens there? Nucleation is influenced by temperature fluctuation. Uh, so that uh, it tends to produce a so-called uh, growth striation, like what you see here. So you see all these lines here? Many lines, so 100 micron is here. So in this case, uh, the separation is uh, in a few micron. Separation so, so uh, is a few micron. So this is a few micron. Crystal grown, crystal ball is less in this direction. This uh, striation separation is a few micron. So this means when this, uh, 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 especially the bottom part, when it rotates once, we grow, grow crystal. So the whole thing is uh, pushed down by a certain amount. Right? So rotation once, and then push down by a certain amount. That gives one striation that it reproduced. OK, so. so saying, do you end up getting sort of a corkscrew uh, pattern? Or uh, some, some layer, you know, because it's a continuous. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it can be screw type. It can be screw type. But in very, it's very difficult to see because uh, it's uh, very fine. It, it, the real crystal is very far away whether we can really see this screw, you know, suppose this screw. But uh, we haven't really seen that uh, in, in the sense that it's very, very close distance, right? Five minutes, five minutes, oh wow, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so I was too slow, <laughs> I guess. Uh, okay, so uh, this striation, so if, uh, if you blow up this, so this kind of, uh, you, you see some structure here, okay? So there is, this striation uh, is actually here too. This is just a uh, zoom, uh, in uh, uh, this region. So uh, this uh, growth striation is also important uh, for uh, the temperature fluctuation and rotation speed and growth speed is important. Feeding, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so the, uh, we all discussed. And uh, additional interesting structure you see is something, uh, uh, some kind of domain structure that I, I can discuss a little bit more later. Yes? The striations are flickering, so to speak, of the intensity of the lamp. Basically, basically you can say that. Yeah, I mean intensity is not moving, but uh, this guy is moving. The intensity is fixed. This guy, is, so when it, when this part is here, it's hot. It comes here low, and the, so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, uh, again, uh, this uh, uh, Morton John uh, stability issue, and uh, uh, one of the thing is uh, we do not want super cooling. If it's a super, uh, so again, the growth wise, liquid solid interface is most important. If there is a, some kind of super cooling, and then sudden nucleation can occur. So that tends to induce a kind of dendritic uh, uh, crystal growth that you don't want. So if you do have uh, dendritic growth, basically crystal tends to have all these different orientation like this one. Okay? So uh, one has to also avoid this uh, super cooling. In order to avoid super cooling, the best way is having a large temperature gradient. This large temperature gradient can be used by well-focused, for example, like laser. So that's really the strength of this uh, uh, laser floating zone. Not just high temperature. High temp temperature gradient is large, so the supercooling is reduced. And uh, also, uh, that leads to the stability of uh, Morton John. Okay, so uh, let's see some, some of these numbers. So temperature gradient, infrared floating zone is about uh, 30 degrees per millimeter. And uh, 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 this laser case, uh, we actually we don't really know exact number, but at least it's 150, so more, uh, more than five times of this. Temperature uh, difference is also uh, large, but laser, uh, uh, I, I'm pretty sure this uh, this is kind of a very first version, so that later on uh, one can increase this temperature much more. Okay, so. Three minutes now, right? So three minutes, what can I do? Uh, so half name oxide, I, uh, I, I mentioned uh, half name oxide, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, melt uh, with laser floating zone. Uh, half name oxide, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you heard about this one, but half name oxide is a very, very important uh, material because of uh, 
so-called high K, dielectric. When you make transistor, I, I, I mentioned, but we, these days we don't use transistor. We use uh, CMOS, field effect transistor. FET we use for FET, all this uh, computer and iPhone, and we use uh, uh, FET, field effect transistor. For field effect transistor, what is most critical is uh, so-called gate oxide. <coughs> gate oxide has to be, have a large dielectric constant and also has to be super thin. Okay, and uh, people used to use just uh, simply oxidized silicon, silicon dioxide as a gate oxide. But uh, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, people uh, developed this uh, hafnium oxide gate. And now most of these uh, uh, chips, uh, Intel chips, uh, they do use uh, hafnium oxide uh, gate oxide. So this is very much important. But uh, uh, last of about five years, uh, people uh, uh, discovered if you make a very, very thin hafnium oxide, in fact, it becomes ferroelectric. Ferroelectric. <coughs> and uh, this uh, has been uh, highly controversial. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, it is ferroelectric. Uh, some other people don't see that. And whether, even if it is real, whether it's due to some kind of uh, 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 strain from the uh, substrate for film or whether it's a, uh, something to do with some kind of so-called finite size effect. Very, very super thin, then somehow becomes very electric. Uh, and also whether it's a reproducible, reproducibility has been also an issue. Uh, so, uh, so, and uh, in any case, uh, uh, all these claims of ferroelectricity, uh, is, uh, ortho, uh, ferroelectric phase is orthrombic, and that all those claims uh, 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 are on.